Goodbye, Benny. Welcome back to the Millennial Classics, y'all. My name is Q, and on this channel, we talk about the best and most memorable movies, books, and culture-changing events from our generation. We are here on part two, doing Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. So for the very few people, and I did look at the, the, the statistics, the data, the background, they weren't many, so I don't know who I'm, ap I'm apologizing to, but I have to because I did say I was going to go about the Harry Potter series a little differently than going through the plot and talking about how I feel in that sense of a review. I am telling you, it is very difficult, especially when you're doing a solo review. All I am saying is the very first Harry Potter and review, I really tried to make it creative and different and sexy and all of these things. And I tried with Chamber of Secrets. I, that's not me. I don't have those creative juices, okay? Anyways, I still want to review these books. I love these books. Check out the movie reviews that I'm doing with Mumbury. We will have for future guests doing Prisoner of Azkaban and future books. And we will have featured guests doing the, the movies as well. So join us on this journey. All the links are going to be down in the section below. But let's jump into this book and we'll, we'll start where we usually start. Let's talk about this cover. How do we feel about this cover? And for the most part, I think these books are always, they're nice to look at. They, and the artistic, like the, the the weird artistry of it, I feel like in each book, Harry's scar looks a little bit different. The books obviously came out before the movies. And if this is like the OG covers that most of the books had, Harry Potter, like the actor looks fantastically similar to Harry Potter on these covers of the books. I think that must have been a big part, but I do love this. As you can see in this cover, he's grabbing the phoenix bird that saves him at the end of the day. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. There's no reason for me to talk about, you know, the background and all of these good things. I talked about that in the uh, Philosopher's Stone. So let's get into the meats of this, okay? It starts out with Harry spends a miserable birthday with the Dursleys. Surprise, surprise. What's new? Nothing. New. Mumbury and I, we talk about this all the time when we're discussing the movies. Harry living with the Dursleys is an insane proposition for us, for me to just comprehend. And this was all done due to Dumbledore, right? He thought in the first book that he needs to go live with his closest relatives. Even McGonagall, on the very first day when they first dropped Harry at the footsteps of the Dursleys, was like, this is insane. Why would you do this? I have to say the difference between Dumbledore in the books and the difference between Dumbledore in the movies is when you see it in like eye to eye, it's a whole lot worse. So it's almost harder to believe that someone that is supposed to be the greatest wizard of all with all of this wisdom would allow Harry Potter to live in that family. But the thing we have to come to consideration and understanding is that it is his only family. Technically, he kind of has to go there. But technically, if you're thinking about it, the Dursleys would be fucking in jail right now for child abuse, for neglect, for just torturing the poor kid, okay? So we start off at the Dursleys. Again, Harry's getting treated like shit per usual. And while Harry is there, he's a horrible birthday. He can't wait to get back to school, but it sucks because he hasn't been getting any letters from his friend. So... He's upset. He's like, I wrote, no one called. And I might be getting the books confused, but I think in Chamber of Secrets, Ron tries to call, but he doesn't know how to use the telephone because wizards don't use telephones. And on the phone, Ron is screaming at the top of his lungs. And I don't think that happens in the movie, but I thought it was a really nice touch in the book. No, 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 no. I think that's Prisoner of Azkaban, right? No, I think it's Chamber of Secrets. Ron does try to call. If he doesn't, I am sorry. The Dursleys are having this big dinner because they're trying to schmooze Mr. Dursley's boss so he can get the biggest deal ever. So Dobby, a house elf, warns Harry not to return to Hogwarts, causing havoc while the Dursleys are having this beautiful dinner for Mr. Dursley's boss. And one of the quotes that I like, and I'll throw out the quotes that I like throughout this review, when Dobby says, Harry must not go back to Hogwarts. Hogwarts. And in the movie, I think they set up Dobby so well. And when you're reading through the book, it's told he's a house elf and he's wearing rags. But I don't picture house elves looking as dreary and beat down ever. 
And it's so sad to know when you meet Dobby and Dobby's talking to Harry and Harry's being truly kind to Dobby. And Dobby's like, I've never met a wizard this kind. We know at the end that he's from the, the Malfoys, but no other wizard has treated Dobby with any kindness in his entire life. Bruh. It's either that the wizarding world really does shun and are truly prejudiced against uh, House Elves specifically. And I do want to talk about that because this book, The Chamber of Secrets, talks about the pure bloods and the mud bloods. If you're not going to discriminate against wizards, why would you discriminate against magical beasts and magical beings in a whole? But everyone is offended when Draco and Lucius Malfoy is like, um, pure bloods are better than mud blood, right? So we'll get there when we get there. Anyways, Dobby's trying to get Harry not to go back to Hogwarts. And the way he does it, number one, he's like, why would you want to go back to Hogwarts if your friends don't write back to you? And then Harry's like, wait a hot second, Negro, how do you know? And then he runs away. He finds out that he has all these letters that Ron and Hermione have been sending him, but he couldn't have responded. Dobby's like, you know what? You have to stay. If you don't stay, if you if you actually want to go back, I am going to make the Dursley so mad at you. He runs downstairs. He causes a ruckus. In the book, does he blow up? No, no. In the See, I'm getting confused with the Prisoner of Azkaban. I'm sorry. Because in the Prisoner of Azkaban, his aunt is the one he expands, blows up like a balloon. But in the Chamber of Secrets, it is just the cake, both in the book and in the movie. And I think it's crazy. I think everything that Dobby does, as sympathetic as I feel for him, because... The Malfoys are horrible to him. I do think Dobby's kind of a dumbass. And the way he goes about trying to stop uh, uh, Harry is horrible. But at the same time, even if Dobby were to tell Harry the truth, to have him not go to Hogwarts, the Basilisk, the whole nine, Harry would be like, last year I fucking killed La La Voldemort, right? Single-handedly as a freshman, you know, as a first year at Hogwarts. He no one can touch me. And I fucking hate living with the Dursleys, right? So uh, the Dursleys, they bolt his fucking room shut. They make a, like a, a mailbox where they sliding in food for him. Then Harry's like, this is the worst thing ever. I'm never going to be able to get out of here. And then Harry is rescued by Ron, Fred, and George Weasley in their flying car and spends the rest of the summer at the Weasley's magical home, the burrow. I loved this chapter. I loved the scene in the movie. I thought it was beautifully written and I thought it was beautifully shot. It felt magical. The way they described the house, the way they described all the magical things, remove the gnomes or kick the gnomes out of the yard, which again, like all of these magical creatures that get abused and treated horribly by wizards, I'm going to keep coming back to this because the entire point that everyone is mad at the Malfoys is because that they are discriminating or prejudiced against mudbloods. But throughout the book, like if you read the chapter, what George, Ron, and Fred are doing to these gnomes and what they get Harry to do to these gnomes, they are abusing these creatures with true hatred. I mean, booting them, punting them, like field gold, like kicks out the, of the yard. We are told that this is what you do because the that's the only way you can get rid of the gnomes from living in your yard. Understood, understood. But I just feel like there wasn't a big enough picture as to why we should treat all magical creatures with a minimal of respect. Because booting gnomes out of your yard seems like the worst way of going about treating other magical beasts. You wouldn't do that to any animal. You would have Peter up your ass if you were doing that to any animal. You don't go out of your way to kick squirrels. If you saw someone kick a squirrel and like do it purposefully multiple times in the yard you would call the cops you would say it's insane but no not not at the weasleys that is a, a poo poo thing aside this is the first time we do meet jenny we do meet arthur weasley and i love this entire family it's a beautiful family and they do mention multiple times that percy's doing his percy thing living his best percy life i think we don't get as much of that in the movie and then the family has to go to diagon alley everyone has to go to diagon alley to get the the books harry and his friends encounter gilderoy lockhart who announces his the new defense against the dark arts teacher he is a great character written in on the screen great character in the in the movies very clear that this dude is stupid he's ignorant he's, he's pompous like throughout the whole thing right you don't have enough time to maybe he's actually fantastic but in the book you do believe that this dude is actually fantastic when we come to find out that the way he's gotten many people to believe 
these crazy stories that he's stolen from other people. Again, we go back to the man who hired him, which was Dumbledore. How is he missing some of the biggest, most like crazy things, right? Even when I say in the book, it's more believable in the beginning, it's only believable at Diagon Alley. The second he steps into the building, a Hogwarts, the school, he's actually stupid. He doesn't know any magic. The only magic he knows is the one memory spell that he uses to steal other people's life stories. So it's like Dumbledore is to blame for a lot. A lot. The wisdom is great. I have like three or four Dumbledore quotes that I absolutely love. The wisdom is there, but the actions, the actions are just very far from the goalpost here. Mrs. Weasley is like all like excited to see this, this, this great wizard who just writes books about his tale that he obviously didn't do. Even Hermione's thinking that he's this great superstar of a wizard and everyone is just excited to see him. And then one of my favorite quotes, again, the um, the Malfoy's coming through like they always do. Famous Harry Potter. Potter can't even go into a bookshop without making the front page. Oh, I, that might actually be Lockhart that says it in the book, but in the movie, it is Draco. But either way, it worked very well. No, it is definitely Draco even in the book. I know that for a fact because Gilderoy is the one that pulled Harry over to take a picture with, right? So he wouldn't have said that. I think Draco does say it in both the book and the movie. And it's fantastic because Harry is so against wanting the fame, the lights and all of these things. But you can see right away, this is what Gilderoy is all about. As much of a sly comment as it is, it's also very true the way Draco mentions it, right? Like he's always getting all of the attention. And honestly, if you went to school with someone that like that, the greatest wizard, I mean, that beat the, the worst wizard of the history of the world when he was an infant, of course, it would get frustrating. It would get boring. It would get annoying. It really, really would. In the book, the, the fight between Mr. Weasley and Lucius Malfoy is a little bit more fair. You can obviously see that Lucius is a little bit meaner and was willing to, to, to poke the bear in places that Mr. Weasley isn't. But in the movie, the disrespect of the Weasleys is just like, it is hurtful to watch. In the book, they give the Weasleys a little bit more respect than for Lucius Malfoy to undress the entire Weasley family in public. And it's just taken. It's just taken. They're just slapped around in the movie. In the book, they, there's a little bit more dignity given to the Weasleys that I do enjoy a, little, a lot better. In the movie, they literally have soot on their face because they use the flu powder. It's sad to watch. Moving forward, Harry and Ron miss the Hogwarts Express and fly to Hogwarts in an enchanted car only to crash into a whomping willow. Before I talk about the actual flight of the car, this is one of those chapters that does work a whole lot better in the movie than it does in the book because yes you can talk about a flying car and how cool it is and what they're seeing in the background but seeing an actual flying car chase a train is a lot cooler than reading about it, right and in the movie the cgi is fantastic the, the, the only thing that I wanted to mention is this is the chapter where Mr. Weasley says one of the quotes that I absolutely love. Ar Arthur Weasley says, never trust anything that can think for itself if you can't see where it keeps its brain. And this quote comes back and towards the end of the book. You know, we're living in this AI age and I feel like this speaks specifically to that issue. Listen, we have no idea what we're dealing with. And Ron and uh, Harry and Ron figure that out when they're dealing with this car. It is magical to a, to an extent I can't explain, right? We are to believe that Arthur Weasley is the one that is imbuing magic into these muggle um, artifacts or things, right? He put the magic into the car. But then once the car crashes into the Whomping Willow and drives off and spits Harry and Ron and their luggage out on its own, it's like... Now this thing is like, it's sentient, it's alive, it's a, it's a being, it can think for itself, which blows my mind. I mean, it's just a little taste and they don't go as deep into the car and how that becomes its own being and sense of right and wrong because the car does come back to save them further on. But I feel like I have so many questions, right? So many questions. And that's the thing about magic, right? There's no rules to magic. That's why I lean always more towards the sci-fi versus fantasy. There's no wall. There's no end to what magic can do. So you're always asking, why don't you just do magic to fix the problem? Problem. But at least in sci-
sci-fi, you can say we're much more in the future and you have all of this cool AI, but the AI can only do X, Y, and Z. And you believe it because you just believe it. By the way, they get crashed into the Whomping Willy. This is something that actually I felt bad for Snape for. There's not a lot of times that I feel bad for Snape, but Snape is, Snape is a great character, right? But Snape wants Ron and Harry to be expelled, which I do think is a little intense. McGonagall is like, you guys will have detention. I do feel like if you're flying a car, a magical car to the school, right? Where kids are not supposed to use magic outside of the school grounds ever. And that car, it lands into like an ancestral tree, like a, a tree that means something to the, the wizards that have come through Hogwarts for many, many years. I think one detention is such a low bar. It's such an insane thing. When McGonagall set the rule and Dumbledore agreed that they just deserved a detention of pop, a piece, I was like, yeah, I definitely see where Snape is coming. That is straight bullshit. That is straight bullshit. You can't drive a flying car to school, cry into a, a truly great tree that the wizards all love and care for and then just get one detention. I mean, I you get one detention for showing up late to a class. You get one detention for skipping a class. You don't get one detention for muggles seeing you drive a flying car that risks the wizarding world and crashing that car into a tree that means a lot to the, to the Hogwarts, you know, realm. It doesn't add up. The, the favoritism for Harry is is blatant. It's blatant. At Hogwarts, Gilderoy Lockhart starts his uh, his term as the new defense against the dark arts teacher, proving to be more pompous than proficient. There's a little bit longer. I didn't get the full quote. Harry sees um, Lockhart and he's like, famous fickle Harry, like, and then he goes on. But I really like that. Fame is fickle, right? I don't know if that came from Harry, came from JK Rowling, or it was a thing said prior. But it just makes sense and it feels good. The alliteration, it's all there. It's what you want, right? And that's what I mean by the book giving Gilderoy a little bit of oomph, right? Even in the movie, I'm pretty sure that this is a quote that's like in the movies as well. But the difference is, by this point in the movie, you know that Gilderoy is a fucking Goomba, right? And this point in the book, you're like, this dude is famous. He's really cool. Yes, he might like the attention, but I still hope that he knows his magic. You learn right away in the book that, no, the, he lets out the fairies and he does do one, two, like a couple of little uh, magical spells that don't land, that make things a little bit worse. But there's still like the benefit of the doubt that you could give Gilderoy in the book that you can't in the movie. In the movie, he's just a dumbass. In the book, there's a little bit of a question mark that I do like, that I do like, because when you make him so blatantly stupid, then you have to ask, why the hell is he here? It's a school, they're, here, they're supposed to be learning. And then the mystery begins. And this book, the mystery is so, it's so good. The, the mystery behind the Chamber of Secrets, behind who's causing all of these people to get petrified, that is truly a page turner of a book. In um, Philosopher's Stone, you can take your time, you can pause here and there, but in Chamber of Secrets, once you start getting into the mystery, ooh, things get good, things get good quick, and let's jump into it. So tensions rise as the term mudblood is used against Hermione and Harry hears a strange voice, the whisper. The first attack on a student is discovered. I wish I wrote the, the student's name who was petrified first. In the book, I'm pretty sure Harry is on like the Quidditch field and they, they're practicing Quidditch. It's like a rainy day. Harry's getting chased around by the dude who's taking pictures all the time. And then um, when he comes... Oh, that's what happens. It's a rainy day. The captain of the Gryffindor Quidditch team is like, we have to practice every day. We have to win. We have to win. And then Slytherin comes in. And Slytherin has this... Uh, the, 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 the captain of the Slytherin team has a note from, from Snape telling them we they can practice as well. Draco pulls out his Nimbus 2002, right? Because he got the newer one. And then the entire crew is rocking the 2002 Nimbus. And everyone's like, ooh, oh shit, yo, the Slytherin team is going to be moving. It's over. It's over. We find out that Draco is going to be the, the snitch catcher. What's the term for the snitch catcher? <laughs> He's going to be this in the same position for the Slytherin team that Harry is for Gryffindor. And 
the entire team has the best broom. And then Hermione and Ron are just there hanging out. When Hermione comes to defense of Gryffindor and Harry, when Hermione is like, at least Harry didn't have to buy his way into being a part of the Gryffindor Quidditch team. Draco lays it down hard and he lets her know, you're a mudblood. Everyone goes, Ooh. Oh shit. Ron tries to defend Hermione because his wand is broken. Ends up, uh, what's it called? Hitting himself with the magic, with the magical spell. And he's spitting out slugs the entire time, which is really, really, really gross. But I really like this chapter. It's exciting. And the fact that like mudbloods is like this prejudicial term that is used in the world of the magic. It is so obviously a thing that would happen in a world where uh, wizards can be made, made. If it was a situation where wizards could only create wizards, this obviously wouldn't be a thing. But the second that there's some kind of variation, those pure bloods would most definitely feel some type of way. They just allowed Draco to be the heavy handed bully and insult Hermione, which is a very difficult thing to do, by the way, because Hermione knows her fucking shit. So I, I just enjoy this chapter quite a bit. I really like how it just hit. Harry, Ron, and Hermione attend nearly headless Nick's death day party, leading to Harry hearing the mysterious voice again. It's a fun chapter. I do like the idea of headless Nick having a party, and he continuously wants to be a part of this headless community, but he can't be because he's technically not entirely headless. I like that whole storyline, and I don't think that they build that out at all in the movie. They do go to the ghost party, but... I like, I do like that. I thought it was fun. There was this entire thing where Headless Nick has to give a speech. Immediately after he starts giving the speech, the actual Headless folks start playing Headless Polo. And it's, it's fun. It's just, it's fun. It's exciting. But then the, the mystery builds. The mystery builds a little bit more. He hears the voice again. The Chamber of Secrets is said to be open, leaving Miss Morris, the caretaker's cat, petrified. I said this in the movie review, but I also really like it in, in the book. You know, we obviously need Harry to be at these situations so him, Ron, and Hermione can try to figure out what's going on so they're entangled, so they're a part <laughs> so they're a part of this big mist. but it would be way too obvious if he was just there 24-7, right? But the fact that they, it's all put together that he can hear the snake hissing and talking but he doesn't know what he's hearing because he doesn't even know that there's a thing that, that wizards can speak to snakes. I mean, he knows that he could do it but it was accidental and obviously he doesn't know that it's a snake. They, at this point, everyone thinks that it's still a person running around doing everything wild and crazy. And the quote that I absolutely love, the Chamber of Secrets has been opened. Enemies of the air, beware. You'll be next, mudbloods. It's, it hits hard in a children's book, right? Because at this point, Dumbledore and Mrs. McGonnell and Snape, they're all talking about, did Harry do this? How could Harry have done this? And then on top of that, what can we do to fix the cat? And prior to this, I was like, damn. Like, there's actually people dying in this book. I mean, like, lives are being lost. This is insane, intense, right? And then when you say mudbloods are next, after just learning what the mudbloods are, it all builds really, really, really well. During a Quidditch match, Harry is chased by a rogue bludger and ends up with a broken arm. <gasps> Dobby reveals he bewitched the bludger and sealed the gateway to the King's Crossing. Before we get to the point of knowing that Dobby's the one, once Harry's in the into the nurse's office, Gilderoy trying to fix Harry's arm and messing up horribly, beautifully done both in the book and in the movie. And in the book, you can see it so much more. There's a disdain that Harry has for Gilderoy that is clear as day in the book. In the movie, it seems more like Ron dislikes Gilderoy a little bit more than Harry dislikes Gilderoy. But in, in, in the book, it's Harry that's like, I hate this dude, I hate this dude, I hate this dude. Because Harry has actually done some great things and he understands that being asked and talking about those things is pretty scary, number one, because those are all moments in his life which are death, like near death, and or he doesn't remember and his parents died. So it's not this fun, great story that I want to talk about 24-7, but Gilderoy, he, you know, he just, he likes the attention, that's all he wants. 
and he messes up his arm horribly. And both in the book and the movie, the nurse does mention the fact that creating bones is a lot harder than just fixing a broken bone. So he didn't just mess up. He's a dumbass of a, a wizard. What are you doing, Dumbledore? What are you doing? A dueling club is started by Lockhart, where Harry discovers he can speak, I can't say this word, parcel tongue? Yeah, intensifying suspicion against him. This whole setup was dope. The idea of having a dueling club in a wizarding book, in a magical book, is kind of awesome, right? This is what you would expect. There's so many questions that I have about the magic, right? And when the entire thing is that we have this great wizard that's Dumbledore and we have this horrible wizard that's um, Voldemort, you would think that they would be a whole lot more duels, a whole lot more emphasis on the idea that you need to beat the bad wizards with great magic and great magical talent. And they do talk about about that a lot but they talk about it in the sense that Harry is just born with he's just like the chosen one versus the art of actually becoming a better uh, wizard I think JK Rowling like takes that idea of like working at being a great wizard and just puts it all into Hermione her her effort her struggle to be a great witch is that version of goodness of greatness right and then ron is just stumbling along with two great friends who, who either is just born with it or works for it and he just tags on for the for the ride and by the way gratefully because this chamber of secrets is one of the more funnier books i think in the series only due to just gilderoy lockhart he actually is funny um but they go to they do the dueling club snape is like let me show you something special here he brings out a snake harry is telling the snake like he did in um the first book to stop and not chase one of the characters and everyone is like oh shit we couldn't understand and he's talking parcel tongue even snape takes a step back and is like oh damn this is serious if you hear someone talking like an animal you don't know what the person is saying even ron and hermione is like bro what's going on yeah you might have been saying get away get away but no it does not look like that when you're speaking an animal's language that no one else can understand it's usually a slytherin person who could do it and i was is it a fact that only the heirs of Slytherin can speak parcel tongue, or is it like dark wizards only can speak parcel tongue? I always get it mixed up because Hagrid is like only the worst wizards go are from Slytherin, but at the same time, it's like some of the greatest, greatest in the sense of the talent, right? Not like the goodness in their heart. Anyways, he speaks parcel tongue, and people are like, "Oh damn, Harry, what's pop?" Moving forward, Harry, Ron, and Hermione use Polyjuice potion to transform into Slytherin students the plan goes awry because Hermione turns into a cat and Hermione is the one that's putting this entire potion together and I respect her so much again for doing this because you, you guys gotta remember the message on the wall was like beware those who are against the heir of Slytherin and the mudbloods are next Hermione is a mudblood through and through and she's she's very afraid number one the other thing is it's like I don't know if it's clearly stated, but it's all, it, it seems that way, specifically starting in this book, that Hermione feels like she has to be an extra great wizard because she doesn't have a, a parent that is a wizard or a witch. So like on top of the weight that she feels like she needs to prove herself because her parents don't have magic, don't know magic, can't use magic. She's also now being attacked, singled out and like being told that she might be petrified next. And she does actually get petrified, which really sucks. Like every time when you're reading a portion in this book prior to them actually coming out with the polyjuice potion, her Hermione is like, okay, we have to do this polyjuice. We have to make this polyjuice. We got to do it. They get like a teacher to sign a paper that says that they could sneak in and not sneak in, that they could take out the book that has the, the potion materials. It is, oh no, they had to trick Snape because wasn't the potion book in Snape's room? Yeah, the, the potion book was in Snape's closet or back room or whatever. So they had to do some sneaky baziki and Hermione was all about it. She needs this to happen because she needs to prove that as a mudblood she needs to prove that she can hold her own and of course she can't she's the smartest witch she's the smartest in this entire book Hermione's like 
is is that witch. Harry finds an old diary belonging to Tom Riddle, which shows him a memory of Riddle accusing Hagrid of opening the Chamber of Secrets years before. And the movie version of Harry Potter getting sucked into this book sucks. It gets, it, it's really shitty. But in the book, it truly is interesting. Him being able to see the memories of Tom Riddle in the movie it, it's a crappy scene. The CGI or whatever the green screen situation they use is horrible. It actually is horrible. It's hard to look at. I think the description of what happened in that section is a little laissez-faire compared to what it was in the actual book because there was a lot between him Harry finding the journal and him actually getting sucked in. For he, It's like a good week or two weeks or a month or whatever where he has the journal the Tom Riddle journal, um, and he doesn't know what to do, but he just has this inkling that he needs to keep it, that he needs to hold on to it. And then one one day, he just decides to write into it, and then he gets a response, and that's when he figures it out. Moving forward, after more attacks, Hagrid is taken to Azkaban, and Dumbledore is temporarily removed as headmaster. They think Hagrid's opened the Chamber of Secrets. It, it blows my mind that the rationale, like the wizarding rationale, that they don't have any other way of trying to figure of the situation out. They have no physical proof that Hagrid is had done anything actually to have petrified any of these students, to have allowed this animal, this beast. Number one, they don't even know what animal it is. They just assuming that Hagrid is the one because what, 20 years ago, he let out an animal that caused some ruckus. But for them to now come back to Hagrid with no physical evidence at all and send him to prison. I'm like, where is the law and order, the justice, the, the fair trial, the necessity for, for, for actual evidence, the lawyers? You can't just send someone to prison. And Azkaban is a prison. It's not a jail. It's not a holding place. That's the first decision. It blows my mind. Aragog. This is the actual animal that Hagrid did let loose, and it wasn't the basilisk, basilisk that is causing all of the cat and the people getting petrified. Harry and Ron visit Aragog, a giant spider in the Forbidden Forest, who reveals Hagrid's innocence, but also that his that his kind is dangerous. They try to at attack him. The spider in the movie is good in some shots, but there's a couple of shots, the close-up ones, that it's hard to. It's like it's like a hairy you know, pillow talking, you know, it, it it just looks very, very, very off. It's a hit or miss depending on the darkness and the speed at which you're looking at the spider. But they have like a full on conversation and they talk about Hagrid and in the movie, it's hard. In the book, it's actually pretty intense. And then the Chamber of Secrets. Harry, Ron, and Lockhart venture into the Chamber of Secrets because they, I don't, I, I forget actually from figuring out that Aragog isn't the, the, the animal causing the petrification of all of these people and animals to how they figure out that to get into the chamber of secrets oh wait there is a situation where they're like okay mr lockhart you know all of these special spells you need to go find but they already know it when by the time they go to lockhart's office and like you can't leave you have to go look for Ginny because they find out that Ginny has been taken by this monstrous animal oh yes Yes, that's how they do it. Of course, it's Hermione every goddamn time. So they go see Aragog on their way back after getting saved by the car again. Miss McGonagall stops Harry and Ron and is like, you guys should come look at this. And they find that Hermione has been petrified. Um, and there's another quote somewhere. It's like, when in doubt, always go to the library. Um, I don't know if that's Ron or if it was um, Hermione that said it. As a reader, that's a quote you keep close to your heart. That's a quote you share. But Hermione gets petrified close to the library. They take her to the nurse, nurse's room. And then Ron and um, Harry go see her, go visit Hermione. When they're visiting Hermione, they see that she has a letter in her hand. They pull that letter out. And it has something that explains how they can get into the Chamber of Secrets. After figuring that out, Lockhart is then sent to go take care of it. Go take care of it. Come on, Dumbledore. And... Ron and um, Harry was like, we've got to go with because Ginny was taken and they do find that, that out as well. Two more chapters here. Harry confronts Tom Riddle in the chamber and learns he is Lord Voldemort's younger self. Harry defeats the Basilisk and saves Ginny. 
So this is a very in-depth chapter. We do find out that Tom Riddle is Voldemort, and we find out that in the greatest saying of all, I love bad guys. I love antagonists that hit you with them quotes. Tom Riddle says, Voldemort is my past, present, and future. Beautiful. It's done well. It's done really, really well. The ominous nature in the movie when Tom Riddle comes out is a little iffy, but in the in the book, it that shit is tense because in the book, when they go back and they see the past, Riddle is seen is shown is described to be a really really good guy, and Harry's like, Riddle, you gotta help me here. We gotta save Ginny, and uh, Tom is like, hey, you have no idea what I'm trying to do here, and they go at it again with a lot of these action scenes. It's a big deal, right? There's a huge basilisk. Harry has to get the the sword that's in the sorting hats. Uh, the only way you can get it is if you, uh, you know, there's all of these things that are happening that are is uh, actionable and exciting. All of that is better on screen. There's just some things that are better on screen. And most of the time, those things are like the action, the big, the big scary monster. You want to see these things. In the book, when all of these crazy things are happening, it just makes more sense. In the movie, it just seems like plot armor for the protagonist. Oh my goodness, the, the sword just comes out. But in the book, when it's described, it's described with a lot more magic, right? And you feel the magic in the books. When you're seeing something happen, there's a lot of your imagination that disappears because you can actually physically see it. And it's like, you lose some of the magic seeing the ridiculousness of what happened so Harry could win. And it sucks to say, but it is the truth of the situation. Reading magic is a lot more magical than seeing magic. Because seeing magic sometimes just comes off as very, really? Is this really happening? Bruh. Because that snake, that basilisk, is motherfucking huge. And Harry is a, he's a tiny little kid. Because when you read in the book that he has the, the tooth that's stuck in his arm, and he takes it out and stabs the, 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 the diary. When you read that in the book, it's believable. It's like, holy shit, he had his tooth stuck in him. When you see it in real life, after seeing the size of that snake, you're like, Harry, you died a long time ago. I don't know if you've got the Excalibur with you, but you don't stand a chance, bro. And then final chapter, Harry frees Dobby. Okay. Well, yeah, he does free Dobby, but I don't know why this is my conclusion as to the final chapter. Harry frees Dobby from Malfoy with a clever trick and receives thanks. The truth about the chamber is revealed, clearing Hagrid and restoring peace to Hogwarts. One of the quotes that I really like. Oh, well, I just been thinking if you had died, you'd have been welcome to share my toilet. And that's from Moaning Myrtle said to Harry. It's just another aspect of the comedy in Chamber of Secrets. I did say it was mainly because of Gilder, Gilder, Gilderoy Lockhart, but Moaning Myrtle is actually very funny, and I think she's actually funnier. This is one of the funnier quotes in the book, but she is funnier in the movie than she is in the book. And both in the book and in the movie when it's like, who cares about me? Everyone's making fun of me. 10 points if you throw it in my body. 50 points if you throw it through my head. Like, I I love that. I really, really enjoyed that quote in both um, book and movie. I talk all the shit about Dumbledore, but at the end of the day, his nuggets of wisdom are so juicy, are so beautiful, are so well put that you almost want to say, Maybe there's a plan behind the madness that he allows to happen at Hogwarts, which I think is far fucking fetch. You can't be playing with basilisks and students and the fucking Lord Voldemort. But at the end of the day, when he says things like this, it is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are far more than our ability. And in the book, I gotta say it again, in the book, there is a lot more plausibility, deniability, whatever you want to call it, for Dumbledore not being as ridiculously blah about the fact that there's people, his students, getting petrified in his school, right? There's a lot more plausibility as to why he's making some of these decisions you would fire someone and throw them in jail some of the time if they were doing this to actual students in real life. But in the movie, some of these things, it's undeniable. It's like, why would the headmaster that everyone's calling the greatest wizard of our time be making these dumb ass decisions? But to wrap it up, that quote, 
it's wonderful, right? Because at the end of the movie, yes, it's hooray. Everyone, Jenny is saved, right? The basilisk is taken care of. Harry's a fucking, you know, he's like the dude, the dude, right? The actual guy. Like the thing about the Philosopher's Stone, it was his mom's love that was imbued in him that saved the day that touched the skin of Professor Quirrell. But in the Chamber of Secrets, it is a little bit more of Harry doing actual magic, Harry believing, Harry following the lead of the Gryffindor Phoenix, right? Harry using the hat and trusting what the hat has to say. So there was a little bit more that Harry actually had to do to, to win the day than just have love imbued in him outside of his own control, which I really like. And still, with all of that being said, the question that Harry had for Dumbledore was right. Like, myself and Riddle, we were very, very similar. Riddle saying that the reason that he didn't want to go home that summer was because lived in an orphanage, so that's why he didn't want to leave Hogwarts during the summer, and he would have done anything to stay at Hogwarts, and then he built that entire Slytherin basement, which, by the way, is enormous in the book. In the movie, the idea that Dumbledore had no idea that they had an entire fucking massive basement that had a, a snake, a basilisk the size of, you know, the anaconda python in the anaconda movie down there just hanging out is just, is, is, is hard to believe, is truly hard to believe. The similarities between Tom Riddle and Harry Potter, there's too much for Harry to be like, damn, I am very much like this dude. What is wrong with me? The Sorting Hat told me in the beginning that I probably should go to Slytherin, right? Tom Riddle went to Slytherin. Tom Riddle became this horrible Lord Voldemort that ended up killing Harry's parents. Why are there so many similarities? And this one quote, this one line makes me want to like Dumbledore so much more. But still, we'll see as the mo books move forward. Prisoner of Azkaban will be the next book. Uh, I'm thinking that I'm going to put a piece of this, of some of this up on YouTube. But please, folks, go check us out at our podcast. We're growing very well on YouTube. Slow but steady, the way I like it, the way it should happen. But on our podcast, we are not moving at all. So help us out. Join the podcast. Subscribe. Moving forward, I am going to have quite a few more friends joining me when I do do the book reviews. I, those work a lot better for me. I enjoy those a lot more. But until then, catch you on the flip and definitely check out our reviews. Deuces.